On today's episode of the Mark Titus Show, maybe it is not Duke's year after all. Huh. How about that? Uh, Arizona goes into Cameron, takes down the number two team in America on Friday. Uh, by my count, that means that every preseason top five team in the country has lost an exhibition or a real game <laughs> um, in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah, all the top five have gone down. Only Duke and Michigan State, uh, it counted. Everyone else, it did not count because it was not a real game. Uh, all five starters and double figures for Arizona. They got 15 offensive boards in Cameron Indoor Stadium. Huge W. Arizona has jumped up to number three in the polls. I'm obviously very high on this Arizona team now. Uh We'll talk about that uh, on the show, the, the, this Arizona. But what a fun game to watch. What, it's exactly what college basketball needed um, in terms of an opening week game. I wish it was like an opening night game, but uh, I wish it wasn't on a Friday night. I don't know how many people actually watched. I frankly don't really give a shit because I was watching, and it was an awesome, awesome basketball game. And uh, Arizona got the big win. Um, so now the Champions Classic is tonight. Uh, it was an event that I was very excited about. It's an event that uh, – uh, you know, my interest wanes and waxes year to year. It depends on a lot of factors. Sometimes I'm really into it. Sometimes I'm not. This year, it was trending towards me really being into it. It is in Chicago. I will be going to the United Center. I know Jake Marsh is going. I think Rico Bosco might be going. Uh, haven't haven't double checked with him, but uh, yeah, we're 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 gonna be boots on the ground for this thing. And I was very excited about it, but now we have a Duke versus Michigan State matchup that has been ruined by Arizona and JMU. Um, and suddenly those two teams that were in the top five in the preseason. Uh, aren't quite as aren't quite as uh, interesting as they were a week ago. I guess in Michigan State's case, a little over a week ago. But anyway, uh, Champions Classic is tonight. Duke, Michigan State, Kansas, Kentucky. I got Terrence Oglesby here, uh, or on Zoom, I should say, uh, to break it all down for us. Uh, to is a uh, uh, an, an analyst for the Hornets now. He's he's juggling two jobs. He's he's he wears a lot of hats. He's also he also works for Field of Sixty Eight. Does a podcast with uh, Rob Doster and. Uh, uh, who I've been trying to get on the show forever, by the way, and um, John Fanta, who is uh, you know an absolute legend uh, in, in the college basketball world. But uh, Terrence and I talked about these four teams playing in the Champions Classic. Um, some of the coaches, yeah, I don't know, just all it, it was a Champions Classic preview. You know what it was. Um, we're gonna get we're gonna talk to him, but I want to talk about some of the uh, the opening weekend big thoughts I have before we do that. Uh, fun show coming up. Let's get to it. All right, Terrence Oglesby coming up. Uh, first, I got some opening week, weekend, more weekend takeaways. Uh, I got three big, um, let me see here, three big, uh, how do you want to call this? I guess just play, I don't know. There, I, I, I guess now I'm looking at my notes. I just listed three players, three players I want to talk about. But they uh, beyond just like they had good games and good for them and giving them an attaboy, it was three things that stood out to me as like huge, uh, you know, like uh, – culture shifting type things that that I got very excited about and and three guys I want to point to and be like that's why I'm excited about that team um we will talk about Arizona uh spoiler one of them is going to be about Arizona but first uh the first the first player I want to talk about is Dalton Connect to Tennessee who I've uh absolutely fallen in love with if you've listened to every show or watched every show um in the last few weeks since since I since Dalton Connect came into my life uh when Tennessee played at, at Michigan State in the exhibition game that was on TV uh, that was like last Sunday. That was a couple weeks ago. I I have been just absolutely in love with this kid. And one, it's his game, obviously. Like the, he's he's got it all. His offensive package is incredible. He's going to play in the NBA. He's he he looks like a pro guard on a college basketball court. Um, he's he's so so good. But beyond that, he is a a breath of fresh air. He is a a uh, uh you know a, a gallon of water for a, a thirsty <laughs> Tennessee team. Whatever metaphor you want to use. Dalton Connect is is the oasis in the desert for Tennessee basketball, um, and that's why I'm so fired up about him. He is exactly what this program has needed for the last few years. Uh, 24 points, 8 for 15 from the field, 5 boards, 5 assists, and 36 minutes at Wisconsin on Friday. The Vols win by 10, a Wisconsin team that uh, – um, you know, Ant Wright was on the show last, and he, he's very high on them, and I'm sure he still is long-term. I think Wisconsin will be a pretty good team. Uh, and, and frankly, that is a game that Wisconsin wins. Wisconsin – is a program that wins a game like that on Friday where you have a Tennessee team that has some question marks just in terms of like, you know, uh, I, I Ziegler, Zakai Ziegler, who actually played in this game, how healthy is he going to be? And Vescovy wasn't around because he had the personal matter and he was back home. And, um, you know, they lost some pieces, but they brought in some other pieces. And how much is is uh, is Barnes going to trust Connect? Because he's not always the best defender, but he is great offensively. And, like, 
Wisconsin feasts in those situations where they're where they're at home, they're an underdog, and you have a team that like is it's early in the season, and that team is slowly trying to figure some stuff out. I I kind of expected Wisconsin to win this game. I I I think Tennessee. I thought ten, going into the game, I thought Tennessee is going to be the better team long term. But that just feels like a game Wisconsin usually wins as a program. Uh, and so for Tennessee to go in and win by ten and kind of be in control of the entire game. I mean, I, I if you're a Tennessee fan, you have to be over the moon, especially with how dog shit your football program looked. Like a hard pivot away from football, and let's get basketball rolling. If I'm a volunteer fan, I mean, I'm 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 just I'm flushing the football program down the drain and saying enough of that. Last year was fun. Who cares? Whatever. We're a basketball school now, and I could not be more excited about Dalton Connect. Uh, but yeah, it's I by by my estimation, I would say like 2019 was the last time that Tennessee. Had, like Grant Williams, the Admiral Schofield, that that duo, that that team was like kind of the last time Jordan Bone was on that team too. He he was a bucket. Uh, the last time that Tennessee had a guy that you could just give the ball to and be like, go get us a bucket. Now Tennessee, the last few years has had great teams. They've been defensive minded, and not only defensive minded, I would I would argue they've been kind of one dimensional and and played gross basketball. And um, as much as people like making the argument that defense wins championships and that that's the that's the ticket to the final four that's the ticket to national championships and sec championships and all that you do at the end of the day you have to be balanced like you can't just be one day defense is very important and and you're probably not winning a national championship if you can't guard people no matter how good your offense is but it doesn't it, it the, the opposite is true too like you still have to be able to put the ball in the basket and i think uh you know, when teams can score but can't play defense, it's very easy to point them out as frauds. When teams can guard but can't score, um, there's a little more trust put put in them. And and I don't necessarily think that that should be the case. Uh, and and what I'm saying is like Tennessee, I, to to Rick Barnes' credit, like I think he reached a point where he realized like no matter how good your defense is, it 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 almost doesn't matter because you are going to always hit a wall offensively and at some point you are going to have to you have to make shots to win at this level folks um that's that's something i say on the show all the time it's something tennessee has learned in in ncaa tournaments in the past few years uh and i think i think getting a guy like dalton connect that can that can get you that bucket like i could not be more bullish on this tennessee team now because that is that is exactly 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 what they needed um there are exceptions by the way i mean like san diego state i guess played gross they played gross offense for most of last year, pretty much through the tournament too. Um, and then they they made it to the national championship, lost to UConn. I think if Tennessee were to have done that the last few years, you would obviously consider that a massive success. But uh, one, I think that was an exception, and two, I do think Matt Bradley for San Diego State was a guy who theoretically could go get a bucket. Now he, he last year wasn't as awesome as he was the year before, but uh, he he was a a, a, he he had the, he had the tools, the package, the the ability to go to, to be a, a a guy who could score the basketball. Um, and Tennessee, as as much talent as they've had, they haven't really had that guy since really 2019. And and now they have him. They have him in Dalton Connect, and he's fucking awesome. And I love him so much. And uh, I think Tennessee is very much a national title threat. And that's that's one of my big. I I guess it's an overreaction, but I don't think it is. That's what I mean. Like I think like. Like the overreaction part of me is like Tennessee's winning the national championship after Friday. The the even the rational part of me though is like, listen, they're going to lose a lot of games along the way. Uh, there will be times where shots aren't falling for Connect, and he's for maybe more of a liability on on defense than what he brings to the table on offense. And you know, trying to figure out the uh, the roster, like like bringing Zakai Ziegler off the bench and Vesket, like they kind of have a almost too much talent now. And how do you manage all that? Maybe that'll catch up to him as whatever, but. The long-term vision of this Tennessee team is has become very clear to me simply because they went out and I mean Ganey is another dude obviously a transfer that they picked up who who can who could score a little bit but can, let's not let's not kid ourselves Connect is that dude and and 24 points um, played 36 minutes which tells me Rick Barnes gets it too that like he understands like that's a horse you're gonna have to ride uh, when when the time comes um, I, I I think we're it's setting up for him to have a really special season I think Tennessee could be very very good so that was. That was opening week, uh, takeaway number one. Number two, another guy I want to talk about, Samson Johnson on UConn. Uh, this UConn team, I 
I don't know. I, I don't think I was a hater. I had some sort of doubts, which I, I think I, I was pretty clear uh, throughout the preseason that the doubts weren't that I didn't think UConn would be good. It was more of like I just loved the core that they had last year. Hawkins, Sonogo, and Jackson are three dudes that I just was, was frankly, I, I was obsessed with them as basketball players. I loved watching them last year. Um, I, I love that national title team that UConn had last year. Um, and losing those three guys, I was just like, you know, I, I – Th those guys are, are, are awesome and they're not going to be on the team anymore. So I, I want to see what UConn looks like. Um, I, I don't necessarily think we have our answers yet. UConn hasn't really, you know, played that tough of a schedule, obviously. But uh, one thing that stood out to me with, with Samson Johnson, who's a, a, a kid that's uh, uh, in his junior year now at UConn, um, if you don't pay super close attention to UConn basketball, you might think he's a freshman. And I guess that's my point is uh, – I just want to call attention to what Dan Hurley is doing in, in Connecticut because he really is running his program like an old school basketball, an old school college basketball program. Um, and Samson Johnson's a great example of that. You have a kid that's like been around for a couple of years waiting for his big opportunity. It's finally coming. And so far, again, the schedule has been light. I understand that. But like he plays so hard. He's uh, you know, which is something that you can't take for granted. I think big men in college basketball are, oftentimes dudes that do not go hard and when you find a guy who runs the floor hard and he had the one play against uh i forget which game that was where he like blocked the shot and then and then had a rim run on the other end and got the ball and dunked it um he he's been he's been a lot of fun to watch the energy he brings uh I, he's not going to be their best player at any point this year i don't think he's you know like a guy that's going to uh put up monster numbers for them but i do think he's he's we're we're in the midst of the start of the 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 Samson Johnson breakout season, and he, he's kind of playing the Donovan Klingon role of last year. And I guess that's like th that's my overarching point I want to make is just that that UConn very consciously, obviously, um, is the old school basket old school college basketball program where last year uh, they they do take transfers. Obviously, uh, last year they, they they get Tristan Newton and they get Calcaterra and uh, Nahima Lean was from uh, Virginia Tech, I think, is where he transferred from. Um, you have your freshmen who were Klingon and, and Caravan, uh, but at its at their core, Dan Hurley is winning these games with guys that have been around for a couple years. And Sonogo and Jackson and and uh, Hawkins was Sonogo and Jackson, I think, were juniors last year, and Hawkins was a sophomore last year. Um, but it's at least dudes that are from that the core. Those three guys were the core of the team last year. And those were three guys that were not in their first year at UConn. They had been there a year. They had learned the ropes. They had learned the culture. They had learned the system, all that sort of thing. Um, and that that made up the core. And then you decorate. That's the foundation of the cake. And then the icing on the cake is these talented transfers, these talented uh, uh, you know, freshmen that, that you plug in around the core, right? That's the same thing with this team this year. You have Klingon now who has moved on to be a sophomore. He's the best player on the team. You have Caravan, who I think is leading the team in scoring right now. Um, Tristan Newton, who did transfer in last year, but now he's you know won a national title, stuck around. He's here. Uh, you get Cam Spencer. He's the transfer. That's kind of like the added bonus. Stephon Castle is like the freshman. That's the added bonus. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the way UConn is going about roster construction and, and kind of being smart about, like, we do want transfers, but, like, we want to make sure our transfers – fit in with like the rest of what we're doing and at our core we need guys that have been around for a little while and 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 know the system and know um what we're trying to do here i don't know it's it's not like uconn's the only team doing it this way but the fact that they won a national title and we're living in a time in college basketball where uh there's a lot of uh you know chicken little type conversations about nil and transfer portal and all that shit and that like everything's different now and you know the key to winning in college basketball i i, I remember not too long ago that we were saying all this shit about one and done guys and that people were losing their minds that like, Oh shit. Now the, now the formula to win in college basketball is recruiting all the one and done team, like getting five, five star freshmen uh, every single year. And, and the only teams that are ever going to compete are Duke and Kentucky. And then you look up and like Duke and Kentucky each only won one national title playing that way. Um, and I guess that's kind of another point I wanted to make is just that like UConn is for, for as much as every, all the belly aching about like, the key to success now in college basketball is just a revolving door of transfers. You have to go pay a shit ton of money for these recruits, uh, NIL, which isn't to say that these, these UConn guys aren't getting their, their NIL money. I'm sure they are. But, uh, I, I think seeing a guy who just won a national championship and he's doing it with like a little bit of an old school way where like, if you didn't even know the transfer portal was, was so hot 
these days, um, you wouldn't even really think anything of it that, that, that of what Dan Hurley's done the last couple of years. I think like you know, I think they took taken three transfers last year. Maybe maybe they had another one. That I'm forgetting about. That's probably a lot in a given year. Like if the year was like 1997 and you had three transfers on your team and then won a national title, I'm sure that would have been massive news. Um, but yeah, like this year, Cam Spencer seems to be the only guy that I can think of. I don't know. Maybe I, I'm not paying enough attention. But like, it's not like they're loading up on a ton of tr- freshmen, a ton of transfers, whatever. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a foundation that's built with the core and Samson Samson Johnson, uh, who's who seems poised for a breakout year, is a great example of that. It it feels very much like a Jay Wright Villanova situation where it's a guy who uh, you know maybe in a lot of programs were to transfer by now one or more minutes, um, and now. He, he's seen the fruits of his labor uh, because he's been awesome for them uh, early. We'll see. It's a long season. I know all that. But uh, the fact that UConn has found themselves right back in a situation where they can bring a big man off the bench who's incredible is almost unfair. After after doing it with Don McClingan last year, and now they get to do it with Samson Johnson, I'm very jealous. Um, but props to them. All right, number three I want to talk about, uh, another Johnson. We're talking Johnsons on the show today, folks. Uh, you like the one too, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> I I, almost, I was trying to think of a third Johnson that I could put on here and just make the segment big Johnsons. These are the biggest Johnsons in uh in college basketball. But Keisha Johnson um, for Arizona, who uh, I don't want to say was completely a difference maker for Arizona because they had all five starters were in double figures and um they were all they all played their part in in the win over over Duke. Uh, but Keisha Johnson did have the and one, by the way, when Duke slapped the floor. When Duke, I think, took the lead, I think they were up. And then all five guys slapped the floor because, of course, they do. It's like an instinct. They can't even help it. They didn't even do it consciously. In fact, if you ask the Duke players, why did you slap the floor, I don't even think they would say they did. They'd be like, did we? I didn't even know we did. Like, we were just, we were just, you know, uh, running on instinct out there. I had no idea that all five of us slapped the floor at the exact same time and then immediately gave up an and one and never led the game after that. <laughs> um,. But yeah, Keisha Johnson had the end one, if I remember right. Uh, but I, I want to talk about him and this Arizona team because uh, Keisha Johnson uh, obviously started for San Diego State in the national championship game this past season. Uh, started for them, I believe, every single game the year before. He started every single San Diego State game for two straight seasons, culminating in a national championship appearance. And then transferred to a power five, six, I guess it's six in, in college basketball, uh, school. And I don't want to say it was, like, unreported or, like, you know, f- flew completely under the radar, but the f- the fact of the matter was that he wasn't even the biggest splash of a transfer to Arizona. On, he wasn't even the biggest splash of a transfer on his own team. Caleb Love transferring to Arizona was the far bigger story. Um, some of that, obviously, was Caleb Love's situation going to Michigan first and, and that a whole sticky mess. But uh, the fact that there was a national champion starter, a national championship starter who transferred to Arizona, and I, I feel like it kind of flew under the radar a little bit. Um, that That's, like, unheard of. Uh, but anyway, fast forward to the, the game in Cameron, and you're seeing why Keisha Johnson is so important to this, this Arizona team. Uh, I mean, having Kylan Bo- Boswell, having Keisha Johnson, having Caleb Love, um, who, whether you think they're, they're three of the most talented players in the world or not, they have immense talent for what it's worth, but... Those three dudes are some motherfuckers now, and I say that lovingly. Like, those three dudes are are just – like, Keisha Johnson is bringing a culture to Arizona that I don't want to say they didn't have. Benedict Matherin was that dude. I fucking love him. Um, there have been some they've, – they've had some uh, some dogs through the years. But having having a tough-nosed son of a bitch like him, having Caleb Love, who I can talk about in a second, is is very erratic basketball player, uh, was not exactly awesome on offense uh, against Duke. But as much as you want to rip on him for turning the ball over and taking dumb shots and all that, he brings it on defense. He 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 brings effort. He's he's busting his ass. He uh he's playing with the swagger. Um, and then Kylan Boswell is the same way, dude. Like he's he's like a he somehow gets younger every year. I don't know how that happens, but every time you talk about Kylan Boswell, he's he's a year younger than he was the year before. <laughs> I swear to God, that's how it works. Um, but those three dudes are tough as nails. Uh, and and I felt like I felt like Arizona punk Duke. I feel like that was the story of the game. I mean, Arizona does have a ton of talent. Duke probably has more though. And Arizona just punked the shit out of them. Um, and Keisha Johnson's a big reason why. And I just I wanted to call attention to like having a guy like him who can guard any position. His offense, he's still got that San Diego State in him. Uh, you know, he he's capable. He can shoot the ball. He can score. 
Um, I, I would love to see him shoot the ball a little bit better or shoot the ball a little less often. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I still feel like we're going to look up, and in February he's, he's going to be shooting like 21% from the three-point line. But he is capable. He can, he can hit threes. Um, but, yeah, this, this, this Arizona team, uh, obviously coming off a big win at Duke, uh, everybody's going to be high on them. But I think that was what stood out to me. It wasn't just that. They won. It was how they won. Um, and they, they won with some dudes that were just tough as shit, man. And Keisha Johnson was a massive, 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 massive pick. The biggest transfer pickup that nobody was talking about, including myself. I mean, I mentioned it every so often, but, like, every time we'd have a guest on in the offseason and we were talking about transfers, uh, I, Keisha Johnson was probably, like, the, the 10th, 11th guy I would list um, when, when, you're, when you're ripping through the, the noteworthy transfers in college basketball. And, and he might go down as the most impactful. I mean – Hunter Dickinson will, will be the most impactful. He might go down as let me let me try that again. He might go down as the second most impactful because uh, Hunter will almost certainly be number one. But uh, just a huge huge pickup for for Arizona and and uh, yeah, Arizona is a team that uh, is is also sort of flying under the radar in the sense that they lost to Princeton. I've talked about it a little bit, um, but it it is interesting that Purdue losing to a 16 seed kind of made everybody forget that Arizona also had a pretty good team last year. And, and shit down their leg when the tournament came around. Lost to Princeton, blew it. Um, kind of, I don't I don't feel like they choked the year before, but they were the best team in the country, I felt, the year before, uh, the Matherin team. Um, and, and that team kind of, they what, they lose in the, the Sweet 16 to, to Houston, I think. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the last couple Tommy Lloyd, Tommy Lloyd's start has been incredible in the regular season. I don't think... Uh, it's way too early to start forming narratives that he can't get it done in March, but uh, that's you know they are coming off a season where they just lost to a 15 seed, and there were some questions about Arizona. Just say, like, I mean, there are questions about every team. It's college basketball, but uh, for them to go into Cameron Indoor Stadium against a, a Duke team that I still I just, I'm still kind of high on. I, I love Kyle Filipowski. Uh, I, I think Duke's going to be incredibly talented by the end of the year, but for for Arizona to go into Cameron Indoor Stadium and completely punk Duke and, and come out with a win with the balance that they showed and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, and, and defensively, I thought they were great. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to see what this Arizona team can, can become, especially because, I mean, speaking of bringing Samson Johnson off the bench for UConn uh, and how unfair it is to bring a big guy like that off the bench, what the hell is this shit that, that Arizona is pulling where they have a Litho a seven foot two Lithuanian that they just pull off the bench and can play, dude. He was incredible. Uh what was it? Crevis. Crevis? Was that his yeah. Um dude, I don't even really know where this guy came from, but he, he I, I had no idea he existed until this Duke game. And he was he was awesome for them. And then you forget that they got they got Visar, who was a seven footer that played from last year, who's hurt. He's apparently going to come back at some point. And I don't know how great he is, but he's another seven. They literally have four seven-footers on this roster, TJ. Arizona. I've always been in the opinion that those should be distributed evenly around college basketball. You cannot have more than one seven-footer. You, should have, you definitely shouldn't no. be allowed to pull a seven-foot guy off the bench mm -hmm. just like halfway through the game. No, that's horseshit. They have four. Yeah. Now, are they actually seven feet tall? Are they you know fudging the numbers? I don't know. You look at the roster. I'm looking at it right now on – actually, I'm not. I lied. I lied. I'm going to tap my chest. I, was, I, I just lied to my audience. I was not looking at it right now. I thought I had it pulled up. I am now looking at it. I am on uh, Sports Reference, which is my uh, database of choice. They have I just, Henry Visar uh, is, is, is a sophomore seven-footer. He's on the team last year. I, I don't think he played a ton, but he, yeah, he averaged two points a game last year. But, you know, he's said it says it right there, seven-foot tall. Dylan Anderson, also a sophomore, seven-foot tall. Uh, Omar Umar Balu, I'm sorry, uh, seven foot tall, who obviously starts for him and is awesome. Uh, and then Crevis, Montegius Crevis, this freshman kid from Lithuania who is is <laughs> he's awesome, dude. He's got great touch, great hands, seven foot two. Um, yeah, I I'm fired up about Arizona. The big question will be Caleb Love. How comfortable can he be being like the fourth best player on this team? Um, will he be okay with that? And Pella Larson, Pella Larson and Caleb Love have like opposite problems. Excuse me, I'm burping. Pe Pella Larson uh, is immensely talented, but doesn't always realize it and disappears at times. 
Caleb Love is immensely talented, but realizes it a little too often, a little too much, and thinks he's better than what he is. Um, if they can find if if Caleb Love can take some of his confidence and give it to Pella Larson, and they can meet in the middle, Arizona, the sky's the limit for this Arizona team. Uh, I just that 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 would be my big question is is can Caleb Love handle a situation where like he's not really necessary? I mean, Kylan Boswell is incredible. Kylan Boswell is I I fucking love watching that kid play basketball. Um, and Pella Larson has all the talent in the world. Like I said, it's just sometimes he doesn't always bring it. He'll disappear for stretches. I uh, there will be a couple games that Arizona will probably lose this year that are head scratchers. But I, I think there there what there there is no drop off in my mind. There's probably going to be no drop off with Tommy Lloyd in Arizona. Uh, and and it felt like coming into the year there might be. They had two great years. This might be a little bit of a dip where Arizona's trending towards like a three or a four seed in the tournament. Uh, it's obviously very early. It's been one week of the season. Um, we're not we're not doing bracketology on this show yet, but I, I see no reason why this Arizona team can't win a national championship and have those aspirations. And um, yeah, they're now ranked third in the country, so uh, I guess that's how that works. Once you're once you touch top five in the AP poll, baby, it's time to lock in and uh, start changing your expectations. And think you got Final Four written all over you. So uh, anyway, Keyshad Johnson, huge pickup. Uh, wanted to call attention to that because I I. For all for all the headlines that Caleb Love made going to Tucson, I think Keyshad Johnson is a far 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 more important um, pickup for Arizona. And I and I and I don't base it off of one game. And I don't I'm not even really a Caleb Love hater. I don't mean to to shit on him too much. I just think Keyshad Johnson is is going to bring an element to Arizona all year. Um, he's just going to be a Swiss Army knife defensively, and he's he's got the experience. But he he just has a toughness that the, that they will lean on heavily and. I'm I'm fired up to see what he can do at Tucson. Uh, all right, enough of that. Let's talk about the Champions Classic with Terrence Oglesby. Quick break to talk about our friends at Game Time. A lot of fun stuff going on around the country. Uh, shows there are, are obviously sports going on. A uh, ton of sports going on. Hockey's going on. I got to get to a hockey game. I got to go over to United Center and watch a Bedard play uh, sometime soon. I'm, I am going to the United Center uh, to to go to the Champions Classic. And if you're listening to this and you would like to go to the United Center, so you could go to the Champions Classic. It's not too late. That's the thing about Game Time. Uh, last minute tickets are available. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. So if you're someone that's like, I want to go, but the event started, I, w- I really cared more about the second game. Duke and Michigan State have already lost, and but I got to be honest, man, Kansas Kentucky could be a pretty good game. Great news, you can you can buy a ticket when, even after the first game has already started, even after the first game is already over, you could go to Game Time probably. And scoop up a ticket if you want to come to this Champions Classic. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. With Zone Deals, you pick the section and Game Time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. You heard that right. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Titus for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Titus for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. College basketball is rolling. There are a ton of fun games going on all over the country. You want to go see them. You 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 who listen to this show and watch this show are smart enough to know that watching college basketball in person is so much better than watching it on television. Get to the arena, download game time, go take it in with your own two eyes. Thank me later. All right. Terrence Oglesby is here. Uh, the champions classic tonight in Chicago, um, an event that's been going on for how many years is this now that this thing is 20, 2011. It says was the first one. Is that true? Um, I guess my first question to you is like, does this still pop for you? Is this still an event? Has this uh, has this event jumped the shark? Because I do remember when it was first announced, we all got very excited about it. There have certainly been some legendary moments along the way, um, but I don't want to say that like it's it's an afterthought now. But I I don't know how much juice it has anymore. So that's why I'm 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 asking you that. Like for you personally, yeah. On the on the college basketball calendar, does the Champions Classic still have juice? It's it's still has some juice. I think it has more juice when it's like on opening day. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like be, because then it's like the whole kickoff, and you don't have like people playing Presbyterian on day one, right? November six, and that's nothing against Presbyterian, but you get what I'm saying. Like yeah. people want to see the big dogs, big dogs eat. So it's like it does have some cachet. Don't get me wrong, but I, I think sometimes when you have all this, 
it can get lost in the mix a little bit because like Gavit games are coming up too, and there's right. some great games in the Gavit games. So yeah. it's like it's just kind of another one of these you know good games as opposed to it being like the main show it, like it was in 2011. Through I mean what two years ago they were doing it an opening day. Yeah, not to, I, someone told me they they moved it because uh, of elections. Like they started realizing that every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of November, is not exactly a great night to compete with. Um, but I don't know. I was like, just who cares? just started on a Monday this year. Yeah, just do it on the Monday. That like, why do we get? Yeah. But then ESPN wants to do it, I guess, for the college football playoff nonsense. I don't know. It's all. St- I, I agree with you though, because like. I mean, I, I was really excited about the Champions Classic a week ago, and then Duke lost at home to Arizona, and Michigan State lost at home <laughs> to, uh, I guess, a little over a week ago, before the season started. And then Michigan State loses at home to James Madison, and now we're looking up at a Duke-Michigan State game that, you know, has a little bit of the wind has been taken out of the sails. But I'm yeah. fired up. I'm fired up for this year because I think this feels like one of the few Champions Classic where it's less of an NBA event, which isn't to say that there aren't NBA players in this event. There always will be when these four programs are playing. But, like, you have – a situation where uh, the best players on each team are like Tyson Walker and Hunter Dickinson and maybe arguably Antonio Reeves. He probably won't end up being the best player for Kentucky, but like, you know, he's he's kind of – he's probably not their best player, but for the sake of my argument, he is. And even Filipowski yeah. uh, is – he's, he's going to be a lottery pick, but like I'm – he's he's an incredible college player and I, I he's back for a sophomore year. Um so yeah, I'm I'm excited for that part. I think because usually it's it feels like an NBA event more so than a college basketball event, which is very very different. But for you, you're I mean you're an NBA guy now, Tio. So like the the lines have been blurred. So <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm both right. Like no, I, I agree with that to an extent. Like I, I love Dewan Harris and and you know Hunter Dickinson going down to Kansas, which. By the way, I thought he would get a lot more deep post touches. He just hasn't seemed to do that. He's been getting a lot of like short rolls, yeah. eight foot floaters. Like I, that's I I was just kind of rewatching the first half before we jumped on here. Like it just kind of confusing where some of his shots have come in. He still gets eighteen and eight. So it's like, you know, I, that's one of the things too. It's been great about the you know NIL and all that stuff. The guys are hanging around instead yeah. of like being potentially second round picks. But you know Tyson Walker. Uh, as a as a as a shooter, as like yourself, how oh, upsetting you. is it? How upsetting is it that Michigan State's two for thirty one on the year? I it, it does not make a lick of sense to me. I mean, Joey House no. was really good, but I didn't realize he was the only guy that could make a shot for that team. Um, yeah, it's but, shot but, making's contagious, man. I'm just blown away. But no, I, I like I like having Tyson Walker around. Like, not an NBA guy. Big wings usually go to the league, right? So yeah. it's kind of one of those things. You know, the best positions going into this thing outside of Kentucky, you know, point guards and five men. Yeah. Which, you know, aren't at a premium right now uh, in the NBA just because everybody's looking for these big positionless dudes. Right. Right. Um, All right. So let's talk about, I guess, the games. Uh, I don't want to prognosticate too much, um, but at the same time, just kind of talk about like what what we're trying to accomplish with these uh these two games tonight and and what the teams look like and all that sort of thing uh so first game is duke michigan state like i said two teams that have already lost which uh i i think honestly i may i i was really really excited to see this game and it has it has impacted my excitement to see that like duke i i was really high on duke coming into the year and then they just against arizona it felt like I mean, they they miss Derek Lively immensely. They have they had no like yeah. interior defense whatsoever. I do love Filipowski though. Um, the Duke freshman did not show up for that game whatsoever. Uh, and and Michigan State, I mean, it, they 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 are an interesting. I've I've been talking about them for a while now, okay, because they lost so long ago. But like they are just an interesting case of like they brought everyone back, but also like the team they brought back was a seven seed. And also like their most talented players might actually be their freshmen, but their freshmen don't seem to be ready. It's just like a whole mix. How do you read like both of these teams? Like, I guess, I guess maybe we'll frame it this way. Like, who do you, who do you think uh, so far who's loss? Um, who are you more concerned about? I guess like who, who long-term do you like more and all that sort of thing? I think if I'm looking at it, I'm a little bit more bullish on Duke than I would be Michigan State because, like, you go two for 31, there's there's issues there. Yeah. And I'm not sure how they really fix it. And that front court, the, the insistence on playing Matty Sissoko is, is maddening. Yes. Uh, he's just he's just there. Uh, and you got Xavier Booker, who was 
depending on who you talk to, the top high school guy in the country coming in, and he's barely seeing the floor. Uh, Duke's got problems, though. I mean, it, what you said about Derek Lively, I've I've been on board with since the preseason. The, where's the rim protection? That's yeah. the scary part about it. You play Mark Mitchell, who's really good defender on the ball. He had two blocks, but he's not like this mega rim protector that they've had in years past. Shel even going back to Sheldon Williams days, which is you know right around when me and you played, like they, they've always had somebody there. You were kind of wondering, like, was Sean Stewart going to be able to be that guy? Yeah. And he's not. He's he's more Trevor Booker than he is Derek Lively. Like, super athlete, jumps out of the jumps out of the gym, but, like, he's got to have his body on you first, and he's not really this intimidating presence at the rim. And not to mention him and Reeves together, they're two potential shot blockers combined for six minutes. So uh, I'd be more worried about that. Those guys aren't ready. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's kind of the reason why – these coaches want to push it back a week, but it's a week. Like, how much are you really going to figure out? And I, I think it's strange that they want to move it back. And I understand it was for the election for one day, but then they wanted to keep it that way because they're like, well, I want to be able to have a game under my belt. That, yeah. You don't lose anything by playing this game. Yeah, and the guy's You're very lucky to have this game. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. The guy's not being ready is a feature. That's what we're there for. It's like, that's what makes it fun. It's like, you're just throwing them into the fire and see who's going to sink and who's going to swim, you know? And Yeah, and who, and how how ready is Paolo, was Paolo Bancaro? Like, did we really right. think he was going to be that ready last year? Yeah. That dude was silly. Yeah. Tyrese Maxey was another I remember Tyrese Maxey uh, in the garden came off the bench for Kentucky. I think that was the 1-2 game when Kentucky played Michigan State. And Tyrese Maxey, like, couldn't miss. That was awesome. That's what made it awesome. Is like, I had, yeah. I don't really, I mean, I sort of follow recruiting, but I'm not going to tell you I can, like, break down all these freshmen's games until I see them on a college court because I don't, I don't watch it. I don't follow it that closely. And to have those moments where it's like, I, I've heard of Tyrese Maxey. I've never really seen him play. And then, like, one of the first tastes I get is him in Madison Square Garden balling out. I was like, this is awesome. This is yeah. That's what I want. I don't want to be. I don't want to go into this Duke Michigan State game tonight and be like. I mean, I've heard Caleb Foster's pretty good, but I watched him almost put up a thirteen trillion against Arizona. So like, I'm not exactly. I'm not exactly expecting much. Um, he was. He was one. He was one foul away from a thirteen yeah. minute trilly. Dude. Uh, yeah. So what's the what what. Like, why does Izzo – I love Izzo, and I do give him the benefit of the doubt with this stuff, but, like, what is it about him that I think uh, Michigan State can lose that opening game? And, uh, you know, all of us are seeing what you saw, which is Matty Sizoko is getting way too many minutes. Like, if Michigan State really wants to be serious about a national championship, they got to figure that out. But at the same yeah. time, there's something about Izzo where you're like, no, 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 he knows what he's doing. This is all part of his – plan like like the Michigan State fans have gotten so conditioned to lose a game in November and be like actually this was a good thing this is exactly what we needed this is what Tom Izzo yeah. needs why why is he like the one coach that gets that you know what I think I have a lot of it has to do with the fact that he has the ability to humble really talented young people mm -hmm. and then get them to buy into what he wants them to do they're not straying off track in in March yeah, like they're doing their jobs in March, and and a lot of that has to do with the buildup. And I think he knows that his team is good enough to make the tournament. Like he he knows that it's a matter of getting the really good freshmen to be basically sophomores by the time they're in March. And I, I it's hard for me to ever question Izzo. I'm with you right there. Like he's done yeah. it so well for so long. You do kind of wonder though, like. Xavier Booker is really good, and he's just sitting over there. Yeah. Now he did play 17 minutes against Southern Indiana. I get all that, but like, I, I'm just kind of sitting here wondering, like, who's going to give first? Because when you play a really talented team, you need him out there. Yeah. Because he has that kind. He has that next level length, and you know this just as well as I do. Like, when a pro walks in the building, you know. Yeah. You you, you know it, and you know it in warmups. Like it's one of those things, like. You got to have that in order to compete at the highest level. When they're playing Duke, they have that big size. They got to be able to throw another body out there. Like, I think if they're going to have one of their post players guard Filipowski, I, I would have a hard time believing it was Sissoko. I'd be much more apt to think that Booker would be able to get out there on a the perimeter. Yeah. Um, so, like, what's going to give first, right? Yeah. And maybe tonight, maybe, you know, Champions Classic that, like, Izzo might just turn Booker loose tonight. I don't know, and see what he maybe, maybe that's his mindset. Is like, well, we'll he might have just been holding him back for yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not wrong. I mean, I remember Suzuko, um, the same sort of like when the the reason I think he, I, boy, I don't know, but do you remember Suzuko on the uh, aircraft carrier? It's like the one thing I keep pointing back to when I remember Suzuko like just kind of came out of nowhere. That was like one of their first. That was Michigan State's. Uh, was that last year or two years ago? Um, 
when they played Gonzaga on the aircraft carrier and Suzuko wasn't it two years ago yeah. because like they were having some issues and then they they just scrapped it for the next year and yeah. then just talk of them trying to get back out there. <laughs> he just uh, but Suzuko he, he kind of just like threw into the fire the same way where it was like uh, the big question mark was does Michigan State have a good big man and then he like played pretty decently well and I've been waiting for him to rediscover that magic ever since but like Izzo's known to do well, that, he just guess, plays just freaking starts... hard yeah and, and like that's... in that kind of messy game where it's windy outside that's you're playing true on a ship, that's true that's true like <laughs> the dude who fouls the hardest and that's the dude who rebounds the best is gonna be good like, that's a great point i can't believe they're still trying to play that shit out there just an like, ugly that's the craziest ass game. Part to me. yeah that's so funny yeah. um one of the things about duke if i'm overreacting to duke losing uh at, at home to arizona i felt like arizona punked punked them i mean arizona was just like tough as shit and was like going going at him inside no rim protection um now you know you're in a lot of ways you are overreacting because it was a close game and the you know duke yeah. had the lead they they slapped the floor which i think was when they did the team slapping you know, they, they did a team slapping to the floor late and uh then immediately gave up it always an works and, they immediately gave up an and one and then lost the game um so, you know, they were right there, and I don't mean to, like, pretend like they lost by 25, but I did I did notice, like, from the gate, Arizona was, like, tougher and, and had, you know, they just kind of punked Duke a little bit. And I guess my concern, T.O., is, is are we worried about Shire? Do you think Shire I, – I like Shire as a coach. I like him as a, uh, as a human being. Um, it, does he have the capability to motherfuck his guys like Kay did? That's, that's my concern I, with Shire. I don't know that he doesn't. But okay. I also think that he could be a little better as far as communicating with those guys. Like, the one thing I liked about John was how many times he changed shit up last year. Yeah. Like, he went from pressure. He tried some zone full court pressure. He decided to guard man. He decided – and then later in the year, Lively started coming along and getting healthier. Like, he changed things so much. The the physicality thing is a worrisome thing for me, though. Yeah. Like, because you're going to play a lot of really physical games. And, like, I understand – like, I think the ACC is better this year. I, I went on and made like a crazy statement that the ACC is the second best conference in college. But it's not. <laughs> I understand it's not. It was a hot take show. It's, it's not. Right. I get all that. <laughs> Trust me. It's a hot take show. Um, but like there's going to be some physical nights. Uh, there's some pretty good five men in that league. And like you're going to have to battle around. The, the most telling thing to me is not only was the rim protection poor, but they gave up 15 offensive boards. Yeah. Can't, yeah, you can't do that. And when you're not going to really play a true five, Filipowski's not a true five. He's he's more Matthew Hurt than he is you yeah. know, Sheldon Williams, just for the sake of me already mentioning him. Like, he's going to be out there on the perimeter. He's going to try to do those things. Uh, by and large, though, somebody's going to have to step up off the bench. Like, Sean Stewart, I'm worried about that. They did punk him. And I, Omar Balo is huge. He's, he's massive. And then Arizona's bringing he's a – massive. Seven foot two freshman off the bench that was killing as well. Um, yeah. Where the hell did that guy come from? <laughs> Somewhere in Europe, I don't probably know. knowing Tom he gets Lewis. him. How many <laughs> languages uh, Tommy speaks is beyond me. Yeah, like he he's got so many guys from so many different places. But it, you you throw a couple of other things in there. Keisha Johnson's super physical. Yeah, just a bad dude, and I I mean that in the most complimentary way possible. He's a bad dude. Uh, Pele Larson's tough as shit. Like they just got a bunch of guys. And then they have guys who can rim attack too. And when you don't have anything, it just puts you in constant rotation if you don't have a shot block. I think that's the, the bad part. The reason I'm I'm overreacting is just the last time we saw Duke uh was against Tennessee in the Sweet Sixteen and they got punked in that game. I mean that was that was less of a basketball game and more of a rock fight and uh Duke just kind of kept looking at the bench, kept looking at the refs, kept looking at the bench, kept looking at the refs, like is anybody going to do anything about this? And Tennessee's like, No bitch. This is the these are the, we dictated the terms. This <laughs> yeah. is what we're doing. Uh, we're getting into a fight here, um, and then come that around. Was a Euros Plavsic special. Yeah, it really was, dude. He was the, that dude was that dude was in hog heaven. Oh, son. like man. he could just kill people. Yeah, and like it just. Well, we'll give him a we'll give him a flagrant or whatever. Um, we'll, just, we'll keep him in. And then for for the first, I know this wasn't Duke's first game, but it's their first like meaningful game of the season to be playing Arizona, and it wasn't quite as bad as Tennessee. And again, like Duke was right there in the end, but it just felt like the same sort of vibe of like, oh, there's one team that's way tougher than the other team. Um, I'm a little bit worried about that about Duke, but they are. I love Filipowski. Do you think Filipowski, uh, like he's got? I don't know. I don't know how to say this because I, I I I don't know. I, it's going to be Edie's to lose, but I I've been high on the the idea of Filipowski winning National Player of the Year because I think he's insanely talented and um yeah I I you know I I think he's I think he's first team All American good, but uh yeah you're high on him too. Uh, I no, I agree with that. I yeah. agree with that. 
I think, you know, <laughs> here's another small thing about Duke is the fact that they're trying to call blocks on everything. <laughs> yeah. Like, and have, being a guy that played against Duke when they just fell and it was a freaking charge, like that is a, that's a game changer for them. The fact that they can't take charges anymore and then throw on top of that, you don't have anybody that can contest at the rim. Yeah. That's like a double whammy because there's that's always, defense. People always <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's two ways to protect the rim. You can do it with charges. You could do it, you know, blocking shots and they don't have anybody to block shots. You got to do it with charges, but they're not calling charges anymore because everybody's tired of watching them. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. So, yeah, those dudes love charges at Cameron Indoor. Yeah, boy, do the, they. The wind blows hard. It's Duke's ball. Like, <laughs> you play, it's, did you play against Paulus? Yeah. He was there your ears? Yeah. Yeah, he's there. He's right. He's on my wall. Oh, right. right over there. On, well, yeah, no, he's he's over there on my wall. Oh, I yeah, yeah. There he, oh, my God. Yeah, there's a picture of you just taking it right past him. He he probably fell yeah, down he, that wall. Great, great, scouting, great scouting report by Paulus because he knew I couldn't put it on the floor. <laughs> So like I don't know if it's like a great, just a great picture. I probably turned it over, but yeah, I got Greg up on my wall. That's amazing. The dude could take a charge. Yeah, he he is he's the face to me of uh, Danny Green dunking on him, and as Paulus is taking the charge, that's that's the face of the Duke charge taker. <laughs> I th I think if Paulus, dude, he 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 got dunked on so hard in our game too. Jeray Grant dunked on him. <laughs> Jeremy Jeremy Grant's brother, mm -hmm. his older brother, I played with. He dunked on him so hard, and he just trying to take charges. <laughs> I'm not sure you should. They should have done that though. Here's my here, here's been my kind of like. I think the charge call is okay. I think they need to move the charge circle out a foot and a half. Yeah. Because but, what happens then is is like you're going to have to get them on the step before. And yeah. That's what they're trying to do now. That's, that would have been solved if they just moved the charge circle out another foot and a half, two feet. Yeah. I'm. I I've been very anti charges, but I also like understand the necessity for you know not letting players just bowl people over and i also understand that like getting rid of the charges completely is not ever going to happen um but yeah i i agree like move it out a little more get rid of the i i just want to get rid of the emergency i have no other play so let me try to slide under him situations like i think that's yeah. the that's the shit that i mean we you know like you you, you know as well as i do I, I, you've taken charges in your life and you know how many times those charges were not, not like they were not like I'm gonna make a good play here, and it was more like ah oh, shit, I got nothing else to do. Let me just try to fall over. More often than not, at least when I took charge, I was like I was like I have, I have no ability to do anything here except just kind of cover my balls and hope for the best. Um, <laughs> yeah, when we when we get switched on a post player, right, right, uh, absolute go to move, absolute which, go to move. Which I don't know. I I, I want to clean that up a little bit. Let's talk about uh let's talk about the other game, which I I I am very excited about. Kansas, the number one team in the country, playing a Kentucky team that uh, I have been way higher on than most people. I guess that's my first. Dude, question. I was about to say the same thing. You're high on Kentucky that, too, dude. That Kentucky team is yeah, good. They're very good, right? I, Why are they ranked so low? And, what what's going like? What is it? Just nobody trusts Cal anymore because the last few years. There, there's something to be said for that part. Yeah, there, that's true. I, I think the other thing is is people, including me, got a little freaked out that they're going so young. Yeah, and but, but I I actually looked at it whenever Cal decided to do that. I looked at it as a positive because he went to he he was like, well, everybody else is going transfer portal. Should I go transfer portal too? And what what he ended up getting was the best transfers. But the problem was all these transfers were really good in like their systems. Right. Like Severe Wheeler was great at Georgia. That's because they were bringing out a ball screen high. He was getting downhill, and they had shooters everywhere, and he was able to make decisions. He's only like five eight. That didn't fit Cal. And then he brought the kid from. Um, just transferred to Cincinnati from Kentucky. Before that, he was at Iowa. Help me out. What's his name? Uh, 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 the white kid. Yeah. Uh, CJ Frederick. CJ Frederick. They yeah. brought CJ Frederick in. It was great in Iowa system, right. playing beside Luca Garza and all this. And then he gets to Cal. It's like he can't create anything. Yeah. And then Severe couldn't shoot. I, I watched the first half of that Texas A&M Commerce game. Man, I loved it. Yeah. Those guys were so fast. And, and not only that, like, He's really urging them to push the ball forward. Yeah. And they turned the ball over a lot. I, I think the game started out, Commerce was up 10-0. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not mad at how this is going. Yeah. Because it was a couple of like sloppy turnovers that after they play a little while, they're going to figure this shit out. And then it was like, once they figure this out, they're going to be dangerous because Dillingham gets wherever he wants. Uh, Wagner gets wherever he wants. They're bringing Trey Mitchell out to the top of the key. Cal hadn't been doing that. Yeah, that's different. He's got a he's got a five man who could shoot it, so there's a lot more space, and 
our, our favorite guy, Reed Shepard's a yeah. bad dude. He's bad dude. He's he is like, a bad he's so good. dude. He's so good. He is so good. And he's <laughs> yeah. not going to get the credit he deserves because it's not all flash, but he just ends up with like an offensive rebound here, a made three there, a help side steal there. Like they just, they're really freaking good. And Antonio Reeves is a good player. Yeah. Like, but DJ, DJ Wagner can go. Uh, Dillingham can go. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of like his old Kentucky teams with like John Wall and uh, was it Bledsoe and some of these guys that they could really create. Yeah. They could really create, put their foot on the gas and get to the cup. Well, now their decision making when they get there needs work, but like, yeah, it's back to the old cow, man. Like I, I watched that game. I was like, Oh shit, they might be back. That's exactly it for me is I think the, the, the concerns of him going young and going back to the freshman. Well, were, were insane to me because I was like, that's vintage Cal, dude. That's like the one thing, the whole reason we know John Calipari's name and the whole reason he's a Hall of Famer and the yeah. whole reason he is who he is is because of a team like this. Now, I don't think this team is as talented as like the John Wall type teams and the, uh, you know, Malik Monk and, and De'Aaron Fox. Like, like I don't think these guards are going to be as talented as that. But as far as like the makeup of the team and you have like young NBA guards, you have uh, a, a situation where Cal's not over coaching because I, I think that's, Funny enough, Terrence, like that was that was my conclusion coming into the season was like I think Kentucky, uh, you you know, as as much as people are piling on Cal for the last few years, I think his problem is that he actually was coaching, and you know, like the 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 narrative (laughs) about Cal forever was that like he just rolled the balls out, and and finally like he started he went away from like. He was like fighting against that. He was like, "I'm gonna go old. I'm gonna coach him up." And like he was spending so much time trying to put like a square peg in a round hole. And I think this year he's yeah. like, "Fuck it. Let's let maybe maybe I do just roll the balls out. Maybe I get a bunch of young, talented dudes." And that's not to say he's not cut. You know, I'm I'm oversimplifying it, but I I do think that that's what Kentucky needs is just like throw all the young talent out there, let them make mistakes, let them grow. Um, but trust that eventually it's going to work out because more often than not, even though people rag on him for winning one national title, I mean, the guy goes to Final Fours all the time. He's been yeah. immensely successful. Like, I, I think this is the perfect form. This Kentucky team feels like a vintage John Calipari team, and I think they're going to be very, very good. And it's so surprising to me that they were ranked so low in the preseason. But You know what's crazy is, like, if there wasn't a COVID season with, like, a bunch of 25-year-old dudes playing college basketball, I think this is – we're looking at this team completely different. That's true. That's true. You know what I mean? Like, because my biggest holdup was like, hey, man, you got 18 and 19 year olds. Those are really talented 18 and 19 year olds. Yeah. However, that SEC, those NIL pockets are deep, son. Yeah. They've been deep for a long time. They've been deep for a long time. And like the fact that they're able to like pick and choose out of the transfer portal, I was like, it, it might be hard for them because they're going to get beat up. That's like, true. Damn, is DJ Wagner fast. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. His, his first step is like unbelievable. Like he gets the spots so quick, and and I love the fact they got lucky. They got lucky with Trey Mitchell and what happened to West Virginia. Yeah. They got really freaking lucky, and that's not to say it wasn't easy to get him because it probably wasn't easy to get him. But like they got really lucky there, and the fact that they have somebody that they can just throw the ball to, I kind of compared a little bit to what Marquette has with Oso Wigadaro. Like yeah. they can just like a- throw it to him, and everybody can just take a deep breath. Right. Like these guards are like super panicked. They throw it to him, and they're just like, okay, where the hell am I supposed to be? Yeah. And, like, they have that settle-down guy. I love having a settle-down guy. Yeah. I love that word. Like, if you have somebody that you can get the ball to and everybody relaxes, yeah, you're going to be okay. And I think Trey is that for that team. Yeah, he's a great passer, like Igodaro is, too, for, for Marquette. Um, But having said all that, Kentucky is going to lose tonight, I think. Uh, Kentucky is is 1-5 in, in the last six Champions Classics. Kansas is 6-1 in, in the last seven. Um. I I yeah I'm worried about Kentucky so like Trey Mitchell's awesome but like I Kentucky does not have a ton of size their two seven footers are not really playing right now I mean they're not playing right now I don't know if they ever will mm-hmm. um can this Kansas team uh, I I I've heard that Avicic may play oh really not this game not this game not this but game, he's gonna but get he's gonna get cleared of, eventually throughout the course of the season yeah. Yeah, throughout the course of the season, I, I think people are positive. All right, well that that would be great. I I want to see. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I I don't know. We'll see. Um, what what about this Kansas team, the number one team in the country? Uh, I've I've I'm probably down on them, but also like I've tried to like, you know, contextualize what being down on Kansas means, which means like I think they're like the sixth best team in the country, and not the first. Right. Like that's a bad year for Bill Self. Um, I don't necessarily think they're the best team in the country, but I do think they win tonight. But uh. Yeah, what what is your initial read on Kansas, and and what do you uh, what what do you think we're going to see from Kansas as the year progresses? 
you know, I was curious to see how this KJ Adams, Hunter Dickinson's four or five would, would go. But I, I think the fact that Hunter is able to shoot the ball a little bit better than I think people realize mm-hmm. at seven foot two or whatever he is, like that's able to, they, they can flop, you know, they can flip flop their fours and their fives. And I like KJ Adams as a player. I think, you know, he boards, he's super athletic, he's powerful. Um, the top end talent, I think El Marco Jackson has to be really, really good. Right. Like, cause he's, he's your guy that could end up being like top 10 pick. Yeah. Um, it, but you know, they've just won for so long. You look at all that, like Hunter Dickinson, has he really won? He's had some good years in Michigan, like really good years. I'm not taking away from that, but like they want to win a national championship and are his habits where they need to be for Bill Self to be happy all the time? Uh, not yet, maybe, but I, I still feel like, man, Bill Self just puts five men in spots to be successful so, so much. And where he was, you know, I was, I'm looking at the Manhattan box score, like he was seven for 14 in 20 minutes. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, He's just going to p- be putting spots to where it's like, man, how could you not score? Yeah. Like, he's... Dewan Harris is such a good point guard. I, I do think Jackson's got to be the guy that kind of puts them over the hump if they want to win a national championship. But, I mean, Furphy's a really good player. You know, Braun came off, surprised me a little bit. I didn't think he was as good as what he was. They just – he just finds ways to get production out of guys that you're just like, mm, yeah, we'll see. And then, like, they're – they end up being really good in really big moments. Like Timberlake was one of four in 19 minutes. I saw him play at Towson. Like he, he, he was a dude. Um, and, and he's going to be one of those guys that kind of, you know, hums along the whole season. And then you're going to see him like in the middle of big 12 play, he's going to be a monster one game and win him a game. Yeah. And Bill just kind of figures it out. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm worried well, about you get 10 million a year. Yeah, That's exactly. Year. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I'm worried about, the the playmaker in terms of uh I mean I've I've been saying this for a while but just like the uh you know the Jalen Wilson and Grady Dick and Christian Brown and and Akbaji like the the wing the athletic wings that you can just you know your 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 settle down guy kind of which like they a lot of those guys played chaotically but it was like when the offense wasn't working they could just throw the ball to them and be like please get us a bucket and they would go get a bucket and I think I think Jackson has to be that for them or Dick Dickinson could be that for them but like I don't. He posts up far out, man. Yeah. Like, he's been posting out, like, 18, like 15, 16 feet. And I think sometimes whenever they know that people are going to trap him, they'll post him they'll out post further him. away from yeah. the goal. Yeah. But, like, I was so used to seeing uh, McCormick a couple of years ago whenever they won the national championship. David McCormick was getting post touches. Right. Like, right there. Right. Yeah. Like, all, like, he was shooting 50% from the field. I don't know how he wasn't shooting 90. Like, he was right there. Yeah. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that's preemptive. Like, we're going to post you up a little bit further out because we know a trap's coming. But there's going to be times like top of the key post feeds where you can't double. They're going to hold those off. They might you might see some more of those. But I think Dickinson's your guy. But your settle down guy there is Dewan Harris. Yeah. Like what better way to like have have who would you rather have than Dewan Harris, your point guard, be your settle down guy? I think yeah. that's I think he's so underrated. Um, yeah, he's uh, uh, Udoko Azabuki is another guy that like led the country in uncalled three seconds. He just stood under the basket at all times. And <laughs> yeah. Would catch it and dunk it on everybody. Um, yeah, that's that's my Kansas big man. That's like the when I picture Kansas big men, that's what I'm seeing. I'm a little worried, and I guess we'll see as the season progresses. Is this uh, the Hunter Dickinson? Is Hunter Dickinson more concerned with winning uh, an NCAA championship or showing NBA scouts his versatility? You know, like is that going to become a concern as as the season progresses? I don't know. Um, yeah, we shall see. But uh, I think the only person that can tell him to shut up and get your ass in the post is Bill. Sutton. Yeah, yeah. Like that's kind of where I'm like, okay, like like I was really fired up for this because he's Bill's not going to pull any punches. He'd be like, yeah, I've coached you and all these other dudes too. Like, what? The, yeah, you're. Yeah, I don't, shit I don't, to me. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're an all American. Sweet, get in line. <laughs> we've got. Yeah, <laughs> we've got we've got exactly. plenty of those. No, I the Kansas. Kansas is just so fascinating because I, I don't think that they're awesome for Kansas' standards, but also I said that about the team that won the national title a couple years ago that I was like, I don't think that this is that great of a Kansas. This isn't one of Bill Self's best teams, and they still won a national title because he's had so many damn good teams through the years. that. He yeah, didn't. like who are his best teams? Like would you point back to that uh, – oh, gosh, who was it? The one that beat Memphis? 08. Uh, Mario Chalmers' yeah. team. Like they had all those McDonald's All-Americans and all that stuff. The 2010 the team ch- was so good. They had, yeah, they they were Sharon the number, Collins, yeah, That's they, the one I'm talking about. Yeah, Sharon and all those guys. Cole Aldridge was on that team. I think they were they were loaded. He was a bench player on that team. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 
he like barely he barely got like eight twelve minutes a game. Yeah. Like he wasn't playing. Darrell Arthur and all those guys. Like yeah. those were great teams. But he just he's found this niche after the one and done and everything part came in. Like, and you'll agree with this, but like the number forty ranked kids do like the number eighty five ranked kids, and he hangs on to them for three years. Yeah. And then he can just kind of mold them how he wants. Then they end up being draft picks, a la Jalen Wilson or somebody like that. They're they're draft picks after their junior senior year. So you get you get them to be really good players for two years, and then that third year they turn into pros. And it's like, where, where have they been? Well, they yeah. already know the system. They're already really good. And it's like, well, he just found this niche. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh. Anything else? I mean, I guess that's uh. I guess we hit all four teams. Um. Appreciate you making time, man. Doster, T.O., and Fanta, you guys, how, how's that going? How, how are, uh, how's the Going three, good. The, Once a week, baby. Once a yeah. week. You got to keep I up love, with Fanta, though, man. We, we have no reschedules. John Fanta. Fanta so is busy. the busiest man in America. He's just popping I, I don't up know on how he does it. I just saw you had to sit down with Patino today that I got to go home yeah. and watch, dude. He's just like, is he getting too powerful, do we think? Like, is Fanta... We got, yeah, he might be getting too powerful. He His really presence is, is too he's, mighty in the Northeast. <laughs> now, he, here's the thing. Like, the crazy part about John Fanta, people don't realize this. Like, he'll be doing a sit-down with Patino, the game at UConn, the game at St. John's, and then turn around and do, like, women's Big East championship yeah. soccer game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, what? What? Dude, I he heard goes, him. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting stuff. And then he does bowling. I, I was going to say, like, I heard him do a bowling this summer. I was like, what the f- – what's going on, dude? Um, watching Fanta in his element, though, is 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 a sight to behold. Watching him, like, filming the uh, – at the Big East tournament, I remember, like, uh, leaving Madison Square Garden at, like, 2 a.m. And I'm groggy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's – as you know, it's, like, long nights at these conference tournaments and everything. And I'm, like, walking <laughs> – Walking out of the arena, and I see Fanta just like bright eyed and bushy tailed doing a selfie video, breaking down all the action as he's like walking through the tunnels of Madison Square. He does it walking through the airports, too. Yeah, like, yeah. And, and like, me- does, he's the best. My favorite I mean, thing, like, he just got married, and like yeah. his wife tried to follow him a day. His wife tried to follow him a day at the Big East tournament for like a four gamer. <laughs> yeah. And she got there with him at like 8 a.m. and didn't finish until 2 a.m. when we did the DTF like late night. Yeah. And <laughs> I turn around and look and his wife or his fiance then his wife now is on her back on the first row of chairs. <laughs> just, just, just knocked out. out. She couldn't, she she couldn't couldn't do it anymore. And I couldn't help it, man. I was like, God bless this woman. Dude, it's, that's what she's getting into. And it's Big every, Fanta though, man. He gets it done. And he it's every it day for that guy, man. He's got he's got energy that he needs to bottle that up, man. Sell it to sell it to people. Um Yeah. I appreciate you making time, man. Appreciate uh had a fun conversation yeah, with you and uh of best course, of, best of, of luck course. with the season. Best of luck with the Hornets. How's that going? The Colin Hornets. It's going game, good. Right? You, you know, hey, look, it's a young team dealing with injuries, dealing with some off court stuff. But you know, by and large, I mean the NBA game. It, it's certainly an adjustment for me. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, it's much more player based. Like I'm, I'm watching players as opposed to schemes, right? And all that stuff. Because college, it's about the coaches, it's about right. the program, it's about the, it's about the pageantry. NBA, it's about the dudes. Yeah. And like. So the, what you ha- what you have to observe is different than what you know you're doing when you're doing it in college. But it's it's going fine. I, I've never done any studio. This is the first time I've done studio, so it's it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy it, and it's you know I got to drive an hour and a half every game. Oh, really? You know, up and yeah, up and an hour and a half back. But outside, because I live in South Carolina. Oh, okay. I guess yeah, you. so it, that's uh, that's kind of the only hang up. But you know, but love it. It's been fun. Uh, it's different. It's different, but yeah, it's been fun. It feels like more and more. It feels like NBA and college basketball are two completely different sports. Like the the divergence it's of the two close. sports. I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I do remember a time like when I was growing up in the '90s that it was the same sport. It was just the NBA guys were way better at it, and now it feels like it's like a completely different sport. It feels like, dude, I'll think I'll think the Hornets are having a bad offensive night, and I look up and they'll have 110 points. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's insane, and like they'll be the like the. At, who was it? Sacramento last year averaged 120.1 points a game. <laughs> Average. Dude, that what means they were having some buck fifty boys. Dude, what the Pacers are doing right now is blowing my mind. They're 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 rolling out like twelve man rotations and everyone's scoring double figures, and I'm just so confused as to how how that could possibly happen. But they found every a one way of those to... guys are gonna get paid too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh Terrence Oglesby, appreciate it. Uh we'll do it again. Thanks, man. All right, man. Pre- thanks. All right, thank you to T O. Uh Fun having him on. The first time I've had him on. First time uh, I met, 
I met Terrence at the uh, Final Four, talked to him a little bit, and uh, said, got to have you on the show next year. He said, anytime, brother, and I'll be damned. Man of his word. Reached out to him. He said, you tell me what time, and I will be there. And uh, here he was. He was a uh, he was he's a better basketball player than um, than he he gives himself credit for at times. He was uh, he was a dude that like uh, played at Clemson for two years, and then if I remember right, he like left early to. But he knew he wasn't going to get drafted in the NBA. But then he had an awesome. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't that awesome, but I thought it was awesome. Overseas career. I don't know. To's he, he he's a hell of a basketball player, but he. I hate that. For some reason, I hate that when guys like downplay their basketball careers. I I wish. Uh, I wish people wouldn't do that, but they do. I, if I was as good as Terrence Oglesby, I would be telling everybody at all times that I was an awesome basketball player. Uh, all right, some shout-outs before we get out of here. Um, I want to start with, with women's college basketball. Uh, this was this was probably – got to think about it. I don't want to get too crazy. Fuck it, let's get crazy. This was the most anticipated women's college basketball season – uh, I can ever remember. Yeah. Uh, with Paige Beckers being healthy again, LSU forms their super team, wins the national championship. Caitlin Clark is back. Um, there's just like so many teams that are so excited about how good they might end up being, and the number one and the number two teams have already lost. TJ, it's chaos. LSU lost to Colorado. UConn lost the other day to uh, shit. I I I remembered it and now I forget. Uh, UConn women lost to. Uh, they just lost the other night to uh, NC State. That's right. Yeah, they lost by 12. And it wasn't just that they're losing. They're getting their asses kicked. I mean, right. Colorado was up huge on LSU. And, and and NC State beat UConn by 12. Or 11, I'm sorry. I'm misreading that. Um, so, yeah, that's exciting. Uh, Ohio State was ranked high, too. And I, I think we lost to USC out of the gate. I think we ranked, like, 7th. And our girls lost, which actually is a good thing. Uh, Tom Izzo coaches the Ohio State women, actually. So, Jokes on all of you. That's a good thing. Losing early is a good thing, and coach is going to use that for adversity uh, is a good thing for us because we're going to build off of that. So uh, the Ohio State women are going to be a force to be reckoned with. But fun, fun women's season to start. Caitlin Clark, I saw, set the record too for uh, um, Iowa scoring. She has the she now officially is the career Iowa scoring leader. So I don't know. I, I wish there's a way to stay. I have the same problem with women's basketball that I have with the United States. Uh, men's soccer team, which is that I just never know when they play. Right, <laughs> I never know the schedule. When it's on, if I'm flipping through and I see a good game, I'm stopping and I'm watching it and I'm locked in on it. Uh, the problem is I just never know when it's on. I have no idea. I like UConn could play Iowa tomorrow and I would have no idea until I turn it on and I'll be damned. It's halftime and UConn's up four on Iowa. Um, Did but you yeah, see the, the transfer news in women's college basketball today? No. What happened? Haley Cavender committed to TCU today. Hmm? Yeah. How do you transfer today? I don't know. The Cavender that, like, twins, way too who, late? The, the social media stars who were at Miami, who had, I believe, retired from college basketball was the way they phrased it. And they're, one of them's just going to TCU now, starting today. Committed. <laughs> I think that they were pursuing a WWE career. I'm, oh, I'm imagining really? Maybe that didn't phase out. They were also working for like a gambling, Jake Paul's gambling company better. I, uh, going, to, going back to school. I think women's basketball should be a a it should they they should use that as the testing ground to uh, try a scenario where there are no eligibility year requirements and you can play as long as you want. Yeah, I think well, I because think women's, most of them make more money in college. Yeah, than they make they more money in pros. college anyway. Yeah, and uh, and just see what happens. See what the see what the pitfalls are. Just give it a test for a little bit. Just see like if Caitlin Clark wants to stay at Iowa for twelve years, let her. She'll make more money. And uh, it'll be more fun for everybody, except for the WNBA. Right. But nobody watches that anyway, so who cares? Um, yeah, that would be awesome. But yeah, I'm fired up for women's basketball. Uh, it, it, it's been it's been great so far. I was watching the Colorado LSU game. Um, that was last week. Uh, that was on opening night, right? That was Monday night. Mm -hmm. I was I, I was locked in on that. That was that was a ton of fun. But yeah, UConn losing is is uh, is something. Um, Ace Bailey signed with Rutgers. I wanted I wanted he to did. talk about that too. That's and that's time. what we're focused on. We're not focused on any other anything else right now. Rutgers, <laughs> Rutgers basketball played a football is... game this weekend. It doesn't yeah. matter. We're focused on did next they? year's basketball season. Yes, uh, did they? Might have I... scored zero <laughs> points, but we're focused on 2024, 2025 basketball. Dylan All Harper eyes. was there for some reason. I feel like you wouldn't go to another person signing unless you had some sort of like 
duo connection to them. So, so what is what is the Dylan Harper situation now? Like, what are we worried yeah. about most? Is it like, is it Rutgers and pro? It's just waiting. Like he keeps saying that he's waiting till spring to like make any decisions. Which is he trying to get more money out of you guys? I don't know. The longer he waits, obviously, the more nerves people are going to build up around it. But what, what other schools are in the running? Duke. All of them, obviously. But Duke. It's Duke. It's Duke yeah. and Rutgers. Probably. So it's, does he want to play with Ace or does he want to play with Cooper Flag? Uh right. Was he at Cooper Flag's? Uh, he was not signing. Interesting. Well, there mm. you go. Mm. That's uh, that's certainly interesting. Um, Marquette at Illinois tonight. Uh, Terrence mentioned it during the show that the the Gavit games are going on um, at the same time as the Champions Classic, which is kind of cool. Kind of sucks. I don't know. That's good to have more college bas good college basketball in, but I think these games are on at the same time. That part sucks. Marquette is playing at Illinois, and I guess if I would have been paying more of attention, uh, maybe I would have rather gone to that game. Uh, I should have driven down to Champaign for that one because I think that could be that could be pretty awesome game. Marquette obviously is a very highly thought of team, and Illinois is is talking them. Uh, Illinois struggled with Oakland the other day. Oakland just might be good. O Oakland almost beat Ohio State, and they gave Illinois a good game too. Um, Shout out to Oakland and uh, Kendrick Nunn. That's Kendrick Nunn's school, right? Kendrick Nunn went to Oakland. I'm almost positive he went to Oakland. I'm doing the thing where you, you know, you're right, and then you pretend <laughs> like you're not, so that way. Oh yeah, damn, there he is. Yeah, Kendrick Nunn transferred from Illinois to Oakland. Um. Anyway, uh, Marquette Illinois, Illinois tonight. I'm fired up to to. I'm not frankly not going to watch that game live, but I will watch it uh, the next morning, and uh, I th I think it could be the game of the night on a night when. The Champions Classic is going on. Uh, last shout-out I had was Ken Palm. Uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes lost on Friday at home to Texas A&M. Um, we, we, Texas A&M is a good team. I think Texas I, – I didn't necessarily expect us to win. Uh, I'm not I'm not really sad about that. I would have liked to have won, but, but Texas A&M is a good basketball team, and I think they'll be right there in the hunt in the SEC all year, win 25-plus games. You know, it's going to be a great year for, for them in College Station. Uh, but I wanted to shout out Ken Palm because Ohio State played decently well against a team that was probably better than us, um, and we lost a semi-close game. And Ken Palm dropped us in his standings, which is a, is a nice change of pace because last year, every fucking game we lost, he'd bump us up like a spot or two. And then I'd have I'd, I'd go check Ken Palm, and it'd be like, like by the end of the year, I felt like we were like a top 20 team on Ken Palm, and we were like 15 and 18 or something like that. Yeah. It was driving me insane, TJ, last year, how like all the analytics people were telling me that Ohio State was not that bad. We just kept losing games. Um, so I thought, after we lost to Texas A&M, I said, I swear to God, if Kim Palm does – if he tries to pull this shit again this year, where I was like, no, you guys played really well against a top 15 team, so I actually think you guys are good. I was going to get so angry. And uh, thankfully he bumped us down because that's what I think the boys need. I think, I think we need to get bumped down. We need to be humbled. Last year, a little too much checking Kim Palm. We were going. Where where did we end up last year? I gotta pull this up. That's like yeah, the argument of like the metrics. On paper, we're good. Right. Yeah. Last year, last year we ended up 49th, but we were. Let me see. Yeah, we were. <laughs> yeah, the bottom kind of fell out. But on Tuesday, January 24th, we had lost. We were 11 and nine. We lost to Illinois. We had lost at that point uh, six of seven, TJ. We were 19th on Ken Palm <laughs> at 11 and nine, and we had lost six of seven. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of gave up on the season, and, and it, it went downhill after that. But even, even in February, in February, we were 11 and 14. We were 11 and 13 in February. We were 34th on Ken Palm. <laughs> That's what you get for cheating we're to just, beat us. We were just losing every single game, and – I guess we were falling a little bit, but we weren't falling that much. And I, it was driving me crazy that that um, Kim Palm was torturing me in that way because I, I kept, like, talking myself into, like, we're not that bad of a team. Anyway, very niche complaint, but uh, shout-out to Kim Palm for uh, finally fixing his algorithm where if you lose, you should go down, right? That's what I think. Um, last thing, how are the beards going, boys? Bad. Real bad. Have you guys bailed yet? I'm about, I think I'm planning on bailing once. Really? Then. I'll leave the mustache, but... Why are you bailing? We're just in Patch City. It's because it just bad. looks gross. It looks horrible. But dude. you can't really see it. Look, <laughs> I I can't see you. Yeah, it's bad. Oh, I'm just in Neck City. I came to a breaking point. I didn't point see the. I've, I haven't night. seen the Neck. I've seen you all day, and uh, I I've never. Way to brag well, about being tall. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
I haven't seen uh, what's going on on your neck, and that's a, now that I see it. It's, it's, <laughs> Cody, you're not so bad, though, because yours is uh, lighter. It, it is lighter. It's coming in decent, but I, I just can't. I think I'm. I think. Tonight, what do you mean you can't? Like you can't. It, 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 it like physically makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I keep doing this all day. What? Because it looks gross and it feels like I my neck just itches all day. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> it is the worst feeling in the world. So I, I you told guys, myself I wouldn't break. Got 17 days left. I don't know. You made it almost halfway into the month. You yeah, shave I feel like it's too late to like give up. I was riding with you guys. I'm shaving the neck. Which I guess is the hardest part. The neck is yeah. the hardest part. That that's the part that does itch. But uh, I'm growing my beard out a little bit for you. Like I, yeah, thanks, man. I haven't shaved the chin. <laughs> can can you see? Can you guys see? <laughs> Squint. Let me get under the light so you guys can see a little. Yeah, you see. You I was yeah. never making it to Thanksgiving because I'm not showing up to see my family for the first time in four months with this going on. But yeah, yeah, it might be time to pull the uh, parachute. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Well, best 14 days of my life. We'll leave this stash. We'll leave this little. Yeah, grizzly. Don't let him go around schools. All right, well, <laughs> when you guys shave, maybe I'll shave. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking to get a haircut. By the way. Whoa. Mm. Yeah. I, and I think I'm thinking gonna cut it short. I Char- don't know. Character change. You do. You do go through character go, oh, changes yeah. when you change your look. I do. Yeah, I change. My goal is like, if you ever Google me and look up pictures of me, it looks like twelve <laughs> different people. Yeah. <laughs> <You> just. <laughs> it's it's easily you're. It's easy to tell when something happened. Yes, like, exactly. Oh, that's when he had a mustache. Yeah, and short I could it. Yeah. I could look at pictures of myself and know exactly what like three month window that was <laughs> based on how fat I am and what my hair and facial hair are doing. <laughs> yeah, you used to have nice like short hair and like yeah clean shaven. My bad. Look. Yeah, I was. Uh, hey, listen, man, I grew up in the Midwest for a yeah. hard ass father. You know, you had a. Yep, all the rules. And then I moved to California, and I said, "Suck it, Dad! I'm growing, I'm growing my hair out. I'm a bad boy now, Dad. Sorry. Uh, no, Dad. My my grandma gets on me more than anyone else now about the hair. She she every time I see Grandma, she's like, "When are you gonna cut that mess?" And yeah, like, good to see you too, Grandma. She's I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Love you too, Grandma. Um, all right, is that it? You guys got anything? Any shout outs? You want to? No, no. Breaking news, no TJ. Shout-out. What? GBs. Done. Yeah, game battles. What happened? Big loss for the gaming community. Game battles, a famous, uh, historically famous gaming website where you could challenge other people and play for money, yeah. ceasing to exist in January. How did that work? Uh, you can like go online, and make an account, and then like put up a, p- a call for challenge, and then for like any game. It was mainly in COD, but a yeah, bunch of games were on there. Decent amount. Play for money. It was an old, old, old yeah. COD community thing. So you, so you'd go on there and say like, I'm. Looking to to go up against the chump for a hundred dollars. Who wants who wants to bet me a hundred dollars that you can't beat me at Call of Duty? Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Yeah, kind of Wild West, but it's just an open challenge that anyone can answer. So if you're just like fucking nasty at Call of Duty, you can make yep. a ton of money. And right? a bunch of pros were on there like being nasty oh. at Call of Duty. It's another piece of my childhood. Why is it gone? Gone. Is it legal? Activision is it Blizzard? Or something? A- Activision Blizzard bought uh, Major League Gaming years ago so that they could start their own like competitive gaming league and then just damn. when they buy stuff they just let it die damn sad pour one out for your gamer sad. boys pour one out for your gbs around the world your gamer boys um i bought that new mario game by the way wonder <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are the gamers into that one yeah um it's up for game of the year is it really mm-hmm. against Bre- uh, tears of the kingdom so tears of the kingdom was awesome yeah I, those are the only games i play i just play the nintendo games the nintendo games that are marketed to like 12 year olds Right. That's right in my wheelhouse. Those are the games that I'm awesome at, and I love playing. The uh, Like, watching you play Fortnite today on the Yak, I, I respect Fortnite. Um, seems like a great game, but, like, it's just too much for me. There it's is like, a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. My my eyeballs were hurting trying to keep up with everything. So In my um, own defense, I had played it every day for the last four and a half years. So. <laughs> Um, all right, thank you to Terrence Oglesby joining us. Uh, I'm excited to go to the Champions Classic tonight. It's going to be fun, um, and and I guess that's probably what we'll talk about on Thursday is, is the games going on, Gavit games going on. Friday. Friday, that's right. We moved it. Good call, TJ. We're doing th- – that makes sense. It made sense. That's the right call. But we are we are Tuesday, Friday now. I'm excited to, to talk about the Champions Classic on Friday. I will see all of you then. Goodbye. <laughs>